If you were born during this time period, you would not be sitting where you're sitting right now. Most likely you'd be working in a factory to help put just enough food on the table for your family to get by each day. Look at these images. What can you tell me about the boys in the pictures? They're young, poor, malnourished, neither ones are wearing shoes. Look at the other boys. There's one boy that's face is wrapped. It's probably a, some sort of injury on the job. Unfortunately for him, there's no workman's compensation or a sick leave. If you can't work, you lose your job because there's a line of boys waiting outside the factory to take your job. The gospel of wealth was a philosophy that connected wealth with responsibility, arguing that those with great material possessions had an equally great obligation to society. A number of Americans used religion to justify the wealth of successful industrialists and bankers. John D. Rockefeller once concluded that, God gave me my riches. Andrew Car Carnegie's article, Wealth, argued that the wealthy had a God-given responsibility to carry out projects of civic philanthropy for the benefit of society. Philanthropy, remember, is an act or gift done or made for humanitarian purposes. It's helping out those who need help. The gospel of wealth and social gospel movements led to an increase in philanthropy. They influenced the captains of industry. Practicing what he preached in wealth, Carnegie distributed over $350 million of his fortune to support the building of libraries, universities, and various public institutions. John D. Rockefeller gave away over $500 million of his fortune, establishing the Rockefeller Foundation, providing funds to, to create the University of Chicago, and creating a medical institute that helped fund, found a cure, cure for yellow fever. The national government did step in and try to limit the influence of big business by passing the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. This made it illegal to form a trust to interfere with free trade between states or with other countries. Unfortunately, the government found it hard to prosecute those trusts and companies stayed one step ahead of the government by separating the trusts into single companies before the government could act. It would not be an effective way to regulate big business until the progressive era of the early 1900s. There are two kinds of labor unions. The first are craft unions. A craft union is made up of skilled workers from one or more trades. Samuel Gompers was the president of the American Federation of Labor. They focused on collective bargaining or negotiations between labor and management to reach written agreements on wages, hours, and working conditions. Their major tactic for these accomplishments came from strikes. These skilled craftsmen were very difficult to replace. So when they refused to work, it would take management time and money to find and retrain a replacement. The second kind of union is an industrial union. This type of union includes semi-skilled and unskilled workers in a specific industry. Eugene Debs created the American Railway Union, which initially won higher wages for its members. So this industrial union would include everyone who worked in the railway industry. This would include engineers, conductors, ticket men, men who put coal in the engine, and the men who loaded the cargo onto the trains. Some of them were skilled workers, such as engineers and conductors. Others were unskilled workers, such as ticket takers, coal workers, and coal cargo loaders. Labor started to create national unions in order to combat the influence of big business. The first national union was the Knights of Labor. They fought for and won the implementation of an eight-hour workday for government employees. The American Federation of Labor was the first permanent labor union. We talked about them on a previous slide. They're led by Samuel Gompers, and they're an alliance of craft unions that use strikes to get what they wanted. As labor unions began to go on strike to fight for better conditions, they turned violent. Union members of the railroad industry went on strike in the Great Strike of 1877. They went on strike for more than a week, but it was broken up when several state governors asked the president to intervene. He sent federal troops to end the strike. The Haymarket Affair occurred after six strikers had been killed at the McCormick Harvester plant. They were meeting in the Chicago Square to protest br police brutality. The rally was dispersing when the police finally showed up. Someone tossed a bomb into the police line, killing seven police officers and several workers. No one knows who threw the bomb, but the two speakers and four radicals from the demonstration were tried and found guilty. Four were hanged and one committed suicide. The Homestead strike occurred in the Carnegie Steel Company's plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Management hired armed guards from the Pinkerton Detective Agency to protect the plant so they could hire replacement workers, or scabs, to work the plant. There was a fierce battle. 
Three Pinkertons and nine workers were killed. It would take the Pennsylvania National Guard to end the strike. Finally, the Pullman strike was a major blow to unions. To break it up, President Cleveland sent in federal troops. The leader of the union was imprisoned, Eugene Debs, and the Pullmans fired most of the workers and blacklisted many others so they couldn't get a railroad job again. The Gilded Age also impacted women. The most prominent female organizer was Mother Jones. She led 80 children on a march to the White House to try to push for the passage of child labor laws. Working conditions in garment factories were also horrible. A fire broke out in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. In the factory, women sewed shirts on one of the upper floors. As the workers tried to flee, they found that all the exit doors were locked. This was done to prevent theft, except for one, one that was engulfed in fire. There was no fire exit on the exterior of the building, so the workers couldn't escape. Some women jumped out of the windows to avoid burning to death. In all, 146 women died. Public outcry forced New York to set up a task force to remedy the problem. Farmers were one of the first groups to push for government regulation of business. Farmers had to pay railroads to ship their crops to markets. The places where they met were called the Grange. The Grange was a simple social outlet for farmers. While at the Grange, farmers began to compare notes about how much railroads were charging them to take their produce to market. When they found out that the railroads were abusing their power, these Granges went to state governments to pass laws against these practices. They passed what became known as Granger Laws to support the farmers. Granger Laws will regulate railroad shipping rates. The railroads, in response, would sue the states, but they lost in the Supreme Court case known as Munn v. Illinois. In this case, states won the right to regulate railroads as long as they were benefiting the public interest. The Supreme Court protected the right of states to regulate railroads in Munn v. Illinois. But there's a problem. Most railroads cut through multiple states. The state laws regulating railroad rates ran into numerous legal problems, especially with railroads that cross state lines. States could only regulate local or short-haul rates. Interstate commerce was a federal matter, and railroad companies adapted to the Granger Laws by simply raising their long-haul or interstate rates. The Supreme Court ruled in the case of Wabash v. Illinois that individual states could not regulate interstate commerce. In effect, the court's decision nullified many of the state regulations achieved by the Grangers. Congress would then respond to the outcry of the farmers and shippers by passing the first federal effort to regulate the railroads. The Interstate Commerce Act of 1886 required railroad rates to be reasonable and just. It also set up the first regulatory agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission, or ICC, which had the power to investigate and prosecute pools, rebates, and other discriminatory practices. Ironically, the first U.S. regulatory commission actually helped the railroads more than it did the farmers. The new commission lost most of its cases in the courts. While on the other hand, railroads found the ICC helpful in stabilizing rates and curtailing destructive competition.